Last week we started talking about Jonah. And I asked the question, was Jonah the hero of the story? And, and we looked at a little bit at Joseph Campbell's monomyth and the hero's journey down into the, the, the abyss and the underworld. And we saw how Jonah kind of took that journey. And we looked a little bit at this guy's idea that almost every story in the Bible goes from infidelity to bondage to return to deliverance. And, and many of the little stories have this, have this structure. In fact, the entire story of the Bible in some ways has a structure similar to that. And we left off last week with the Lord speaking to the fish. Now what's interesting is that the story begins with the Lord speaking to Jonah and the Lord telling him to do something and Jonah does the other thing. And we notice that the way the story is told, we're always invited to compare Jonah to the other characters in the story. Last week we looked at Jonah and the pagan sailors. Well now we look at Jonah and the fish. The fish is more obedient to God than Jonah. So the Lord spoke to the fish and it vomited Jonah up on the dry land. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. And Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey. And he called out, Yet forty days and Nineveh will be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. And they called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least. And again, now we have another contrast. We have Jonah and the people of the city. And where Jonah fled from the Lord initially, now the people of the city, hearing about their own destruction, there's no good news here. Hearing about their own destruction, they repent of the way they're living their lives, and they put on sackcloth and ashes, and they're contrite. Now this gets into a whole bunch of different issues and for, for thousands of years people have been discussing and debating this story. And one of, one of the interesting things that we know of is we have obviously in the Bible the, the record of many Hebrew prophets, but archaeology has a lot of interesting detail of prophets from cities like, like Nineveh that actually had a, a great library in Babylon. And there were prophets in these countries too. And the pattern of these cities was often that oracles from the prophets were usually just given to the king. And, and the king would, would usually be, well, the prophets were usually yes men. And they would tell the king what the king wanted to hear. Or sometimes if the prophets gave an admonition, they would tell the king, you need to devote more money to the temples and to the priests. And these are the kind of things that would happen. Seldom did they get a message like this. And so probably what they would have done is that they would have had some other confirmations that the people of the city and the king would have tried to do. Now if you remember earlier with the pagan sailors, the pagan sailors casted lots and the lot fell on Jonah. And we know that this kind of divination was outside the bounds of the Old Testament law. But what's interesting in the book of Jonah is that God seems to even be speaking to the pagans through their pagan acts. And so God speaks through the lots cast by the pagan sailors, and it's likely implied here that just hearing Jonah, they wouldn't necessarily have believed him, so the king would have wise men, and you can hear about those kinds of things if you read the book of Daniel, and they get confirmed. And so the whole city believes God is going to destroy it. And so, where, and so they imagine that, well, what chance do they have? Because generally speaking with these pagan deities, there is no chance. And cities are overturned regularly. And so, but they figure, well, why not? What do we have to lose? Let's at least reach out to this God and let's at least say we're sorry and let's at least try because who knows, maybe we'll still get destroyed, but, but maybe this God well, listen, maybe this God has a heart. Maybe this God, with this God, we have a chance. The word reached the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne. Again, pay attention to the up and down in the story. He arose from his throne, removed his robe, 
covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he issued a proclamation and published it through Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water. Notice the participation of the animals. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth, and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn away from his evil ways and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that he may not, so that we may not perish. And then what is probably the most interesting verse of the book. I remember reading this book in Hebrew when I was learning Hebrew in seminary. And I'm reading along nicely in the book. And I'm reading, and then God repented of the evil he was about to do. And I said, what? First of all, God can't do evil. And then God is going to repent of the evil he was about to do. And you can see that different translations try to figure this out. ESV. When God saw what he what they did, he turned from their evil. Now they turned from their evil way. God relented of the disaster that he said he would do to them. And he did not do it. And even the Jewish translation of the text, the Jewish English translation, and God renounced the punishment he had planned to bring upon them and not carry it out. What's interesting about this word that, that in the King James is often translated as repenting, it's usually translating of God repenting or changing his mind or changing his course. And, and what's interesting is that the origin of the word comes from breathing deeply. And you almost have the picture of God looking at Nineveh and the violence and the corruption and all the pain that Nineveh was putting the entire, this entire part of the world through. And we saw a lot of that when we went through the book of Kings. And God looks down and sees that they're repenting. And so he breathes deeply. You almost get the sense of a sigh, of a groan. And he says, I will give them a chance. He knows full well what they're like. And we know full well that Nineveh will destroy the northern kingdom. And then Nineveh will return to its warring ways. But just in this moment, they're the bad bet who turns and says they're sorry and repents for that moment. And God says, okay, another chance. I'll relent. What does Jonah think about this? This displeased Jonah greatly. And he was grieved. God is sighing, saying, I'll give them another chance. And Jonah is furious. How can you give them another chance? You know what they're like. He prayed to the Lord and said, Oh Lord, isn't this just what I said when I was still in my own country? Notice we didn't read that in chapter 1. Isn't this just what I said? This is why I fled beforehand to Tarshish. For I know that you are a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in kindness, repenting punishment. Please, Lord, take my life, for I would rather die. If you remember last week, this whole thing started. The word of the Lord came to Jonah and said, Go to Nineveh and call them out and tell them God's going to destroy them. And Jonah apparently said, I know you. You won't, but you should. And so he fled from the face of the Lord. If you remember last week, the tempest came, and that, that word that's used for tempest is a particular word used in the Old Testament about when God shows up as a hurricane, as a storm. Jonah couldn't flee from the presence of the Lord, but he fleed from one manner of the Lord's presence to the other. And then he came back, and now he's furious because he wanted to see the evil Ninevites wasted. And he knew... If, if they repented even just a little bit, God would let them off the hook. And he doesn't want any of that. 
And so now it's interesting, if you remember back when he's with the sailors, he tells the sailors, if you throw me into the sea, and now he says to God, take my life, and here again, Jonah does not take responsibility even for himself, but says, has the, has the sailors throw him into the sea, and now says to God, you and me. So, last week we looked at the question, is Jonah the hero of the story? Is Jonah the master of both worlds? Kind of the, the last phase of almost every story you find in the movie? He's not the master even of himself. And we get into this strange point where we sit in moral judgment over God. And on one hand, we would say, no one should sit in moral judgment over God. But what's interesting is that God sometimes comes into our situation and invites us into conversation about what he should do. And we see this no more clearly than in the story of Abraham. The Lord said the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah was so great and their sin so grievous that I will go down and see if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. If not, I will know. The men turned away and went to Sodom, but the Lord remained standing before Abraham. The Lord remained standing before Abraham. And, and for years, translators have switched this around because it's not proper to say that the Lord stood before Abraham because in the ancient Near East, you always, the lesser stood before the greater. And so to have the Lord stand before Abraham says that Abraham is judging the Lord and they have a, they have a relationship where they're about to debate. If you know the story, they will go on to debate it. But then Abraham approached him and said, will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? And Abraham is about to make his appeal about Lot. But, but this is the reverse. Jonah is not Abraham asking for mercy. Jonah is asking for fire and brimstone. And he wants it done. Now notice God's posture towards Jonah. I'm using the lexi, the, this particular translation that translates the Lord as Yahweh. And Yahweh said, is it right for you to be angry, Jonah? And you almost get the sense that this entire story is about Jonah and his heart and what's in his heart and about his attitude. Because Jonah has, has, has made himself the center of the universe, the center of the world, the one who judges. You're right, you're wrong, you're moral, you're immoral. This is what you deserve, this is what you deserve. And Jonah's very upset. The Lord just asks him a question. Is it right for you to be angry? And Jonah went out of the city and sat down east of the city and made for himself a shelter there. And he sat under it in the shade, waiting to see what would happen to the city. Just like the Ninevites said, we will put on sackcloth and ashes and maybe God will relent. Jonah sits outside of the city and said, I know these Ninevites are lousy people. They're going to mess it up and God's going to smite them and I want to see it. And Yahweh God appointed a plant, an immediate grow over Jonah to be a shade over his head, to save him from his discomfort. And Jonah was very glad about the plant. Well, you know, he's upset with God's decisions about Nineveh, but yeah, he'll take the plant, he'll take the shade, and notice the word, use of the word save here. <laughs> So God appointed a worm at daybreak the next day, and it attacked the plant, and it withered. And when the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on Jonah's head, and he grew faint. Now notice that the plant, the worm, the wind, these aren't just happenstance. God appoints each one. He appointed the plant, for Jonah's comfort, and he appointed the worm and the wind 
for Jonah's comfort, discomfort and says, well, 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 why would God appoint discomfort? Why would God appoint discomfort? What is God doing in this story? When the sun rose, he appointed the scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on Jonah's head, and he grew faint, and he asked that he could die, and said, My death is better than my life. Why does the universe bother to exist at all when there's so much pain? There's a, there's a guy I came across recently that basically said, and he's written a book, and this is kind of his little mission, to convince people, you shouldn't have children because your children will suffer. And it's like, okay, no one should have a child because that child is going to suffer, which means it'd be better if none of us were ever born. How determined are we? in our judgment of God. And what are our judgments based on? Most of our judgments are based on us and where we're sitting and whether things are favorable or unfavorable. Jonah wants an entire city destroyed, but he's so preoccupied with his little plant. And this is exactly a picture of how we are. We are self-centered, puny centers of the universe and what we finally care about is us and our petty little agendas. So God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? And he said, Jonah said, it is right for me to be angry enough to die. Here's the funny thing. C.S. Lewis made this comment once, the door to hell is locked from the inside. What did he mean? You see, Jonah flees from the presence of the Lord and finds that in this world you can't escape him. Well, where will you go to escape him? You don't want to go to heaven because that's where God is. Where's the other place? What is the other place? But Yahweh said, you are troubled about the plant, which you did not labor, nor cause it to grow. It grew up in a night, and it perished in a night. And should I not be concerned about Nineveh, the great city, in which there are more than 120,000 people who do not know their right hand from their left, plus the animals? And the story ends. Well, why would you end the story here? Because this is the point of the story. This is the point of the entire story. This is what the entire story is about. We think about the city and the fish and the smiting and the sailors. The story is about Jonah, but it's about who Jonah sees himself to be. You see, there are two main complaints that I hear. A good God would not tolerate this much evil in the world, therefore he's soft or negligent. And the God of the Bible shouldn't be so picky about people's behaviors. You can't keep both complaints. We want God to use his power, how? To mirror our judgments and values. That's what we want. But we hate the thought of others having power over us. In fact, our entire system of government is built on it with checks and balances. Jonah wanted deliverance from his miseries, even his petties won, but he wanted misery for his enemies. And in fact, this issue is so ancient and this conversation so pervasive that if you go all the way back to Plato's Republic, what's that book about? The book starts with this debate. What is justice? What is righteousness? And the first answer is this. We are guided by analogy of the preceding instances where justice is the art which gives good to friends and evil to enemies. That's what is good. But who is God? And why is Jonah so angry? He's the God who relents. 
He's the God who repents. He's the God that even if everyone around you hears your repentance and nobody else buys it, God listens and says, okay, I'll give you another chance. Maybe 70 times 7. We like this when we see ourselves as needing relief from justice, but not our enemies. Who suffers when God relents, though? God does. God suffers. Every time you forgive, you take a little bit of suffering and you swallow it. You accept it. You, you, you mark it down and you write it off and you assume the debt. That's what all the language goes to work. But what does this look like? What captures, what story captures this in an ideal way? Take a perfect man who has done nothing wrong, place the sins of the world on him. And even when he's being tortured, what does he say about those doing the torture? Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Great quote from Tim Keller. Believe it or not, Albert Camus understood this. In this amazing piece of writing, Camus says almost these exact words. God, Christ, the God-man suffers too. Evil and death can no longer be entirely imputed to him since he suffers and dies. The night on Golgotha is so important because the divinity ostensibly abandoned its traditional privilege and lived through to the end, despair included, the agony of death. But God leaves Jonah with the question. And if you read Luke 15, the parable of the prodigal son, it's the same question. In fact, the parable of the prodigal son ends the same way. The older brother is out in the field. The father has taken the younger brother back. And the older brother is furious because he knows his younger brother. He's thinking, this kid, he has not repented at all. He has cooked up a duplicitous speech to get back into the house. And if you don't believe me, read the story. Because when he's feeding the pigs, he says, even my father's servants have enough to eat. I know I'll say this. And what he says in the parable is a direct quote from in the Old Testament, not Moses, not David, not a prophet, but Pharaoh himself. And the older brother knows this, and he is furious. And the father comes and says, won't you come to the party and the older brother basically says, not if the likes of my brother is there, and now I don't even know about you, Dad. The elder brother and Jonah are the same person. And the question is, are we Jonah? In the end, the question is for the dutiful brother and the decision whether he will join the party at the end of the story. And then our question is, are you in this story? Who are you in this story? Are you the pagan sailors? Are you the Ninevite king? Are you the fish? Are you Jonah? Is Jonah a hero? What is Jonah's issues? See, Assyria will destroy Israel. Babylon will destroy Assyria. And on and on and on and on and on the world goes. But what part will you play in it? Who inherits the earth? Jesus says, the meek. And you say, like Steve Martin does in Leap of Faith, all the meek get is the short end of the stick. God, in Jesus Christ, in this meal we're about to eat, gets the short end of our stick. But then Easter's coming. Who can suffer? like God, to participate in the reconciliation of God. Who finally participates in the party at the end of the story? Well, who wants to be there? Jonah? Story ends. It's not certain. The elder brother? Story ends. It's not certain. 
Both stories are told in just this way. Do you want to be at the party or not? On the night he was betrayed, our Lord took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body given for you. Well, what was he doing? He was taking our sin. He was saying, if there's a short end of the stick, I'll take it. But not in vain for you. Now we're about to hand out bread and juice. Should you take it? Well, the question of the bread and juice is the question of Jonah. Which seat do you want to sit in? Do you want to sit in the central judgment seat of the universe and condemn God and all your enemies and lump them together? Go ahead and try. The problem Jonah had was he's just a man. He sat outside of town with all his anger and bitterness. And the story ends and we don't know. Is Jonah redeemable? The elder brother is out in the field and he stands outside of the party in all his anger and the bitterness and his father comes to him and says, please come back to the party, my son. I want my sons together. And he says, I'll have none of you and my brother. In a sense, Jesus in this meal gives us a foretaste of the party. And the question is, do you want to be part of the party? And you might say, well, of course I want to be part of the party. But by the story here, you should know what that means. Because this party is put together at the cost of Jesus' life. And this is for us. Well, how do we respond to this? This is a debt we cannot pay. We never pay it. It's a gift. How do we live? We live like he did. And if that's for you, then this meal is for you. If it isn't, you may sit with Jonah and the older brother. But if it is, the table is for you.
forgiveness of all your sins. That evening he took a cup and said, this is a new covenant in my blood. The covenants of this world are predictable. It's about giving and taking and demanding. Jesus comes and says, I give, will you receive? Then will you give to those who don't deserve it? This cup is for you.
take, drink, repent and believe that the Lord has taken your sin and separated it as far as the east is from the west. Would you stand?